you always are thinking sustainability first and you want to have an impact with your work, you should come check this out. And so I did and I had a similar reaction to you, which was like, I don't even know, like, I don't even understand what you're saying. And then when they showed it to me and explained how it worked, I thought to myself, this is, this is truly a, a, a huge leap and I want to be part of it. Matt, my mind is blown, my friend. <laughs> I, I have learned about this. This is like the craziest thing in the world. I didn't believe it was true. And then my producer sent me a video of some guy actually showing the physical machine and like testing it and trying it. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I guess we should just start there. What is this thing that you've built? <laughs> so um, the team at Canna, yeah. So we built the world's first molecular beverage printer. Okay. And what the molecular beverage printer, the way you should think about it is it's uh, the beverage aisle on your countertop. Um, it can produce thousands of different beverages uh, on demand uh, and you can personalize those beverages and it uses the water that's in your home and it combines the water that's in your home with uh, uh a whole bunch of different molecules or what we call just ingredients from a couple of different cartridges that fit inside that molecular beverage printer. And so that's what we've been able to do. That's the crazy unlock is water in your home plus the ingredients in our machine can produce thousands of different types of beverages. So these ingredients, like how many of them are there? Yeah, good question. So, so the, the background there, um, roughly three years ago, uh, our chief science officer, Lance, um, Kaiser, uh, he uh, found some research around uh, another professor uh, that had done some work on analyzing a uh, red wine and reducing that red wine, the ingredients down in that red wine. And the red wine is like a complex beverage. It has like 400 plus different ingredients. That's what gives it its aroma and its taste and its mouthfeel. You know, that the, ferment, the natural fermentation process is like results in some complex tastes and, and aromas, right? Um, it, but this professor, it was really awesome. Uh, he, his background's chemical engineering. Uh, he essentially reduced those 400 down to about 40, okay? So that's the kind of ratio that you're dealing at with. And when he reduced it to 40, he taste tested it and no one could tell the difference between the two different types. And so what we've done is we picked up the research Lance did on our, uh, at Canna and essentially recreated that same experiment and was just as successful. And in the process, Lance's background is, um, he is a, uh, a chemical engineer and he has a really good idea of what types of you know molecules or ingredients are needed to create any beverage. And so when he saw the 40 that were in the wine, he's like, you know what, I can use those same ingredients to create like, like a, like a soda, right? Like a cola or the same ingredients to create like an orange juice. And so he went and did the same analysis on a bunch of different beverages. And he realized that there's a set of about 150 unique compounds that allow us to create any uh, beverage in the world and infinite different variations of it. So it's about 150 based on the ability to analyze and understand what's in there and then reduce down and recreate a, a beverage. That's crazy. What, like, can you give me an example of one of these compounds? Yeah, for sure. Uh, a couple. So, I mean, like sugar, like sucrose is, is in okay. a lot of our drinks. So that's in there. Uh, tartaric acid, uh, citric acid. Uh, we add vitamin C. So we fortify beverages as well. So we have ascorbic acid in there. Um, another one, maybe a, a better example for like, say, so coffee, uh, we have caffeine, obviously it's another ingredient that's in coffee and tea. And so another, but like in, in coffee, there's this ingredient called quinic acid that gives coffee. It's, uh, it's like it's bitter taste. And so that's, we have that in there as well. And we just, we can tweak the amount of quinic acid that goes into a, uh, a coffee and it changes the coffee from like light to medium to dark roast to, to even to tea. The same ingredient is used in tea. So there's a whole bunch of ingredients in that. And in we call it the universal set of beverage ingredients. And it's an ingredient cartridge. That's where the 150 live. I get it too, because I'm, like, I'm a fan of cooking, right? And baking. Mm -hmm. And there's like pretty much a handful of components. And you can make just a huge variety of desserts. Um, but yeah, I, I, I love what you guys are doing. And how did you get 
like drawn into this? How did, how did you get pulled into this? Yeah. So, um, I've been here about a year and a half, uh, as the CEO uh, and, um, I met, uh, Bharat Vasan, who is a, uh, the president and CEO at a, at a company called the production board. And the production board is a, uh, think of them as like a VC meets an incubator kind of smashed together. They're run by a guy named David Friedberg. And, um, essentially what they do is they go, their thesis is that we have all the molecules we need on earth and we don't need to all go to Mars and live there. We just need like better modes of, of production on earth. And they apply that to agriculture and health and all kinds of different categories. And so, um, Dave uh, and Lance, Lance Kaiser, again, our chief science officer, was also working at the production at the time. That research that I mentioned before, they came across that together. And they, they, when they, after they did a little of that work, I explained where they ran the analysis, they started to think about how they could commercialize this, this company. They're like, well, well, can we, that's a better way to produce beverages, like it reduces environmental impact. Um, and they started to, what the production board does at that point is when they have deep tech or science, they, 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 they put some resources on it and solve the core problem. And then once they get through that core problem, uh, of the deep technology or the deep, I guess, engineering or the deep science, uh, uh, challenge, and they think they can commercialize it. That's when they start to bring in and they round out the team. So they had spent about three years before I got here. Uh, creating amazing tasting beverages and automating the system. So think of it as we run an analysis, we print a beverage, we taste test it, and we just do that like thousands and thousands of times to get really good tasting beverages. Uh, we're really we're really hydrated over here um, at Canna, and uh, and so um, once they got that system down, they were started to look for people that could take this company to market. And whenever you have a company that is coming from a true kind of technology breakthrough perspective, you got to figure out who's the customer, how do you brand it, how do you design a molecular printer, um, how do you hire the team. And so that's when um, when, I, when I had known Barat from my previous, uh, I worked at EA Sports and video games and I had known Barat from, from my EA days. And uh, he just reached out and said, hey, we're doing something so freaking incredible, you're not even going to believe it. Um, and I know you're, you know, in, you always are thinking sustainability first and you want to have an impact with your work. You should come check this out. And so I did, and I had a similar reaction to you, which was like, I don't even know, like, I don't even understand what you're saying. And then when they showed it to me and explained how it worked, I thought to myself, this is, this is truly a, a, a huge leap and I want to be part of it. I went through so many stages of disbelief. So first I heard it audibly. <laughs> It like explained to me what it was. I was like, no. I was like, all right, this is clearly like some, like, you know, maybe they have a prototype or like a graphic design of what it could look like. And right. So then they started showing me and sharing the videos and I'm like, it exists in the videos. It's not like a 3D render in the videos. I'm like, so it's actually existing. And then I did watch <clears throat> several videos today of those um, uh, people that did the VCs startup thing uh, and them talk about it, how they had been incubating it for three years and it all makes sense and it's pretty cool and I just want to know like, why don't I have one right now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, fair enough. Fair question. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're pretty close, right? So what you saw was um, uh, our a prototype. We have uh, a couple of those prototypes and um, like fully functioning in, in the, in the product world, we call it a looks like and, and works like prototype. So it's like the real deal, like everything that's inside of there, the size, the materials are, is pretty close. And, um, it's just a, it's a, what we're building is complicated and it's never been done before. This is like, you know, this isn't like off, there's not like off the shelf molecular printer parts, right? <laughs> um, like we're creating some things here. So, you know, we have, we have taking our time to make sure that it performs really well. So, um, so, but we're on that path right now. We're actually just finishing up our second set of prototypes and we'll be entering into manufacturing here in the summer. And so our target though, to ship this is in about 12 months is when we'll actually have these out. And if you've pre-ordered, then, you know, you'll be, you'll be getting yours in about 12 months. Yeah. I wasn't going to pre-order. And then I found out that it's like several hundred dollars cheaper if you pre-order. And so, Right. I, I was like, guys, we're buying one for the office. We're buying one for the studio. If I'm going to have people to the studio, come on, man. Yeah. 
I it's modern CTO podcast. I have to have a molecular beverage printer. It wouldn't the studio wouldn't be complete without it. <laughs> That's don't yeah. You have a molecular beverage printer. I mean, you you know, we we talk about it on the engineering side a lot of what got me hooked to at the very beginning um, was that it's a Star Trek replicator, right? This yeah. is truly the first step to being able to recreate anything uh, from its, you know, component parts like on, on demand. So, so that's awesome that you, yeah, you should get one for the office and, and, um, it'll be there in uh, mid of, of 2023. Yeah. I bet you this whole, uh, shutdown and the coronavirus has pushed your pipeline back, right. Or your development time back, because I mean, the manufacturers are like overloaded or shut down and. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things there. I mean, the, the, one was, you know, we're we're doing two things that are super hands-on. Like you got to make beverages and and that's all hands-on, right? There's flavor scientists and chemists and analytical chemists all working on the beverages. And then we have a whole, a whole host of engineers, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, um, embedded software. And so all that is really hands-on. And so when the pandemic hit, I hadn't, hadn't even joined the company yet actually at the time. But it's it slowed down. So it, it yeah. It, if I look at the old uh, uh, dates, it should have actually you know been pretty close to shipping right now. But it's o- only because we just like people couldn't come in the office for like a year. Uh, and so yeah. and in California, there were some pretty strict uh, restrictions around around who could be in the office and who couldn't. Um, but uh, but anyway. Uh, the what's been good is we've been able to speed up and we're getting more momentum and you know we don't i don't know what the future of the you know the supply chains are all messed up i don't know what the future of it looks like uh but we're in a good spot you know as far in the future as we can see you know we've got all the right long lead parts you know teed up and ready to go so again it's just a matter of us making sure that we you know really test test this product a lot before we let it come you know get to your studio yeah, because you definitely want to handle like the durability aspect. You know, they drop the iPhone like ten thousand times, right, <laughs> before they release it. So you, you definitely have to put some miles on it. So it's people are going to love the product, right? Because the last thing you'd want is to push it out early and like everybody get it and it not work as you would imagine it to. Absolutely. I mean, you're talking about beverages. You're talking about something you're drinking every day. Yeah, you can't mess around with that. So our tact is um, like. Let's let's really do a really smart rollout of this product. Let's not like run in and say we're going to do millions of these units. Is like let's scale this up properly. So actually, the end of this year, the end of twenty two, we'll be piloting, and so we'll be piloting in select spots. Uh, we'll be stressing the entire system. But essentially, there's three things that we're always going to do with our product, right? It's like it's got to dispense drinks really quickly. It's got to dispense drinks uh, or the liquids really accurately, and it has to do those uh, consistently. And so, those are the three things that we're test, you know, we're testing for across our product all the time. Um, our engineering team. You mentioned the the iPhone being dropped. Ours is uh, not not. We're not dropping it, um, but uh, it's <laughs> similar. Is we have um, there's some mechanical moving parts in there, and we're essentially, you know, opening and closing and moving those parts, you know, hundreds and thousands and thousands and thousands of times, and we're doing thousands of dispenses uh, of beverages from the device all the time. Not only to stress the device, but also to taste test. That's awesome. That is so cool, man. So, do you have one at your house? I have had one at my house. So like I said, there's only a couple of these molecular printers in the world. Um, and right, the phase we're in right now is we really need our engineering team to continue their progress, right? Like they've significantly de-risked the, uh, you know, the majority of the engineering parts, but uh, as well as the science, the beverage tasting. But we, so we've lo- used a lot of the devices for, for that. Um, I've had one in my house just to more of like a consumer kind of mindset perspective, use it, understand how it changes my behavior, how it impacted my thinking. And then we've got one in, um, we have a kitchen obviously in our office here, uh, but our kitchen is just a demo kitchen. And so we call it the kitchen of the future. And there's a, there's a can of one device in there that we use that's fully functioning. And, you know, if you ever came and visited, you could, you know, we'll, could take you through there and you can, you can try it out and see it. But, um, but yeah, I have only for like three days I got to take it home, but now it's just back here in the kitchen. That is awesome. So like, where's the limitations of this thing? 
they're pretty it's pretty far ranging actually so what we've created is um we've created a system that allows us to dispense any type of liquid and the magic of that is the ingredients that i talked about and knowing what ingredients got to be mixed at what ratio and then also the system that we use to uh dispense those quickly and accurately right and so um essentially we've st- just started with beverages there really is not a lot of limitation in terms of the technology at its core from like a first principles perspective we can do any type of liquid anything that's water soluble at this point and we have a really clear path to be able to probably within five to ten years do yogurts and like like cookies and and that kind of zone um so like the technology is pretty far ranging i know it probably sounds a bit nuts to be like am i gonna get like some food printed out of this. No, this print thing. me some cookies, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm, gonna, like, I'm just going to open my mouth under the cookie machine. And be like, like, feed me cookies. Hey, listen, if, yeah, if they're like, they got that nice, like chewy center, right? And chocolate chip, like who doesn't want one of those? So, um, so there's a path for us to do that. That it, it's pretty, it's pretty impressive actually what the team's is, is, uh, is working on even in our first generation of product. So first generation will do every beverage that you need from a cold brew coffee to a uh, sports drink to a, a functional drink to juices, sodas, uh, flavored seltzers, uh, carbonated water, cocktails, wine. There's just a few things that it, it won't do. We're not going to do hot beverages in the first one. Um, and the reason why is because at, at our core, we're about reducing the environmental impact of beverage creation, the way that we centralize, create it now. And the biggest impact that we can have is by eliminating the plastic bottle uh, waste. And most of that waste comes from cold beverages, right? The stuff that people are drinking in their home now is mostly cold, you know, it's beers, it's wine, it's sports drinks, it's that kind of stuff that's causing... Yeah, my wife buys the... She buys bottles of water and then she buys these like... I don't know what they are. They're these little packets she tears open and puts them in the bottle of water and shakes it. And then we just end up having like a ton of plastic bottles. Yeah. So our goal was like, let's have the biggest impact we possibly can uh, in reducing the bottles and cans that get used to cr- to sh- get ship our beverages from point A to point B. And that's cold, mostly cold to start. And then we'll lean into hot beverages in our second gen device. So has Coca-Cola called you up and been like, what's going on, bro? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, we've had a lot of interest, I would say. Uh, yeah, that's the, that's of, the PR way to say it. <laughs> yeah, we've had a lot of interest, but you know what? What's interesting? I'll, I'll say this too: is like the peop, the, the 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 brands that we've talked to, the the brands that people know and love, they have been, um, from my perspective, more um, more open than I initially thought that they were going to be. Um, because they can I, still make their money, right? Like from what I understood, you don't pay for the cartridge; you pay for the drink. So, like if correct. Red Bull can push Red Bull through your platform and they can still make their money. They're going to move from like having a board meeting about assassinating you <laughs> to like, <laughs> you know, becoming your best friend, right? <laughs> yeah, that's one way. Yeah, I mean, we're, we, you could look at us and essentially, you know, we're a new channel for existing beverage brands. We can get into, um, you know, we're in, in on someone's countertop and that's a super attractive thing for these for these businesses. But I'll also say like from a sustainability perspective, uh, they, they understand what consumers want. They're, they're, they're at least listening, right? They're understanding that consumers of every age are saying whatever brand that I buy my stuff from can be consumables and ours can be shoes, can be shirts. Just, I want to know that that company cares about mother nature and that the way that they're producing their products uh, is in a sustainable fashion. And so some of these companies, I mean, that's not how they were formed, right? Like go back a hundred years to some of these big beverage companies. That, that wasn't the topic. That wasn't the thing. It was just like scale, scale, more, more. And they didn't think of water waste or CO2 emissions or bottle or can um, waste. And so here we come along with taking those, you know, the sustainability first approach and, you know, they know that at the end of the day, the consumer decides. And so consumers want, don't want companies that are impacting the environment. So we're a great way for them 
to bring that that sort of uh, positioning for their company and that impact to their business without them having to do a ton of investment. No, it's it's it is pretty cool. I'm not like a super like I love I'm a human and I love Earth. Uh, and I definitely want to have clean water and I want things to work well. And when I see all the plastic in the ocean, I'm like, somebody hurry up with those microbial things that are going to eat it, right? Like, who who doesn't want their home to be clean and nice, right? Um, but when I saw all the plastic in the video and I thought about it, it, it the problem with me processing this is it's, it's literally can take out like, what, 70%? of the bottles of water like that people are converting to other things or, or shipping. Like it can, it's have, it's going to, it affects so many different things, right? Because you have the freight to ship the water. You have like the cleaning of the, you have the manufacturing of the plastic. You have all of these things on top. And then you have the, the other part of the chain, which is like the companies, right? That are doing the commerce in order to generate that. And there's just so many areas. And then you put this machine in front of you and you're just like, that is that's way better. Like that's that's smarter. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know if you look at the the centralized model now, you have you grow all the ingredients, you have to water and irrigate them. You gotta load all that those ingredients, those raw ingredients onto you know uh, transport. You get that to a factory. They got to get processed. There's more water that gets used in the processing. Then you start uh, bottling. Right. And then once you're done bottling and packaging, you put those on cars and you trucks, planes, whatever, you fly them and drive them around. You're emitting CO2. And then what ends up, I think, kind of sucking about the whole thing is that you and I, as consumers, you know, that, you know, I, I want a beverage and whatever, my, my hard kombucha. And then at the end of the day, though, I'm the one holding the empty, <laughs> the empty bottle. And then uh, I know where I, I live now, I can recycle the plastic, but where I moved from, uh, you couldn't. The, 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 the county wasn't even accepting plastic bottles at the time. Just throw them in the, in the garbage. So this ending up in the landfill. So through that process, you have CO2 emissions, you have water waste, and you have, um, and you have the consumer, as a result of it, kind of get left holding the bag with all these packaging waste. So what we asked ourselves when we first started this started the the um, research with Lance three years ago was like, okay, if we can sh- if we can recreate beverages from just a little bit from just the 40 you know key ingredients as an example with wine. And could we concentrate those down to the level where we can go create hundreds and hundreds of servings of that single beverage, right? And then that allows us to not have that allows us to have um, to eliminate around 80% of the package and bottling waste. It's about 100 bottles and cans a month we can eliminate from someone's home as a result of them using canna. Uh, we can significantly reduce the water waste because we, we're not contributing. To, you don't have to create any of the, you don't have to grow anything. You don't have to process it. You, know, you don't have to wash the, the, the bottle before they stick the label on it at the factory. Like that doesn't exist anymore because all the labels and stuff are digital, right? Um, it's all on a screen on the device. And then we're we're not shipping around heavy heavy containers um, that only produce one beverage. We're shipping a cartridge that produces over a month's worth of beverages, and so we flipped that equation from one to one, one bottle, one beverage to one cartridge equals hundreds of beverages. So we're removing yeah about eighty percent across the board of those those three categories. Is the alcoholic drinks? actually alcoholic or do they just taste like the alcoholic drink they're, no they're actually they're actually alcohol um so so yeah this is the if you're in a frat house this is the party the party molecular printer do you have so, like yeah. a do you have like a party add-on where you, <laughs> <laughs> like a giant because there's only how much alcohol is in that cylinder though yeah so the the goal for us is to have everything last about a month so we ship people um a couple of different cartridges. So there's the ingredient cartridge. That's the magic, that universal set of beverage ingredients, okay? That is thousands of different beverages across all those different categories I mentioned before. And then we have a spirits cartridge, which you're asking about. Uh, we have CO2, if people want to carbonate their drinks. Uh, and then we have a, um, a sugar cartridge because we put a lot of sugar in beverages in general. 
Um, it, so we have a separate can, cartridge for that. So all those cartridges get shipped to somebody. Uh, we know exactly how much is in the the container or in the cartridge, I should say. So we only ship it exactly when you need it. This isn't like a subscribe and save thing where like stuff just piles up on your doorstep, right? We we get it there only when you need it. But um, to your question, we want all of that to last about a month. So we're still figuring out the exact amount of alcohol in there. Um, but it's about a handle, well, handle like, like 1.75 liters. Um, and so that's what we use. It's a, it's a um, uh, neutral grain spirit very similar to the way that alcohol is made now, right? You know, if you and I started a, a liquor company, a spirits company, you know, we call up, a, we call up, a, or you could start it for, you know, for, for your company. You, you essentially call someone up who's a distiller and you're like, Hey, I want to make this type of alcohol. They take a neutral grain spirit, they color it and they flavor it. And then they call it whatever you want to call it, bourbon or whiskey or whatever. And so we use the same ingredients that are already in the supply chains and already in the beverages that we're we're consuming, but we just combine it with different ingredients in a different way. If you don't drink, can you like opt out of the cartridge? Yeah, totally, a hundred percent. Yeah, that's it's actually that's a interesting point. What one of the things? And it's, I'm guessing it's a macro trend uh, as well. Like I, I I've seen even before I worked at Canna, it's just like alcohol consumption in general uh, is trending a little is trending down, and the consumer that's purchasing. That, that our product is resonating with is that consumer that's a little more aware of the impacts of alcohol and sugar on their body. And they really like the idea that they can adjust the amount of sugar or and alcohol or just like not have alcohol at all. So if you don't want alcohol, you don't have to have it. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, I maybe have three or four drinks a year. Like I don't, I don't drink a lot of. I did in my twenties, <laughs> and then <laughs> I had how kids. times have changed. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can not drink and have kids. I mean, it's a, yeah. it's not a fun thing being hung over with screaming kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I like, I like this. I'm going to pre-order one before we get a little bit farther in in the conversation. Um, where can people go to pre-order this? So Canada.com. Uh, go to Canada.com. C A N A. Dot com and you can pre-order right now. It's $99 reservation fee. And that reservation fee gets you the Canna One device for $499 when it comes out. And the regular price is $799. Now that $499 price uh, is limited to the first 10,000 people that pre-order. And um, we're getting we're getting close. So um, if you're hearing this, it's, I would say if you're, in, if you're sitting on the fence or you just want to do it, uh, now's the time. Cause we're getting pretty close to hitting our cap. Yeah. I'm definitely the early adopter type. Like when I see something that makes sense, I'm like, we should, we should at least have one. Right. Um, mm-hmm. it's just the future and I personally, I, I like to support the future and it's great that it also like it helps the environment and all of that stuff too. So there's just a lot of uh, wins. That's probably why you joined this project. You were doing your thing at Nike, right? And then you got over here, and uh, <laughs> I, th- this is just is just a really neat project, man. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty fantastic. Yeah, there's a lot to like. I think there's a lot of things to like, and it's uh, it it's a big step. This is a you know this isn't this is like a new category that we're creating of decentralized beverage manufacturing. And so it, there's a lot to be excited about. The thing for me personally is just, I really love the idea of reducing the environmental impact and just, you know, doing the most we can with technology and science to prolong, you know, our natural, our use of the earth and use of our natural resources. Now, do you think that this is a thing that, um, like, will kids be using it too? Or will just the parents? Is there like locks on it? Like, how does that all work? Yeah, yeah another, a good question. Yeah. Um, yeah, as a parent myself, yeah, that's one of the first things that you think about is, okay, who can get access to the stuff in here? So, uh, so it's actually, I think it's way more secure. What we have is more secure than what exists in the house now. I mean, someone can go buy some beers and they can just, there's in the fridge, they're just sitting there. Like your kids can just open the fridge and get access or whatever your spirits are in a, in a cupboard probably. Um, and so what we do is all of our stuff is, uh, so first of all, you got to be 21 to just like get alcohol. So when you buy your can of one and you check out and you say, yeah, I want alcohol, like we got to verify. So we verify there. Then the stuff gets shipped to you and the courier 
verifies too. Got to look and be like, all right, Joel's 21. Cool. Here, here's your cartridge. If you're not, they take it back. And then, and then once it's at the device, so you got to get through those two pieces as well. Once it's in the device, so you put it, the cartridge in the device, when you go and uh, set up, you create a profile. So it's like, Joel, oh yeah, that's right. We verified your age. We got your driver's license. Uh, looks like you probably want alcohol. Cool. If you don't, you can flip it and you know, you can turn it off. Um, and you create other profiles for other people at the same time. So you might be like, you know, daughter click or son click, and you can just say like no alcohol, no caffeine. And so when they go to use it, they just select from their profile, tap on their you know profile image, and then they have an access to only the set of beverages that you want them to have access to. So you could eliminate soda, you could eliminate whatever you want and they can only get, I don't know, you know, vitamin C enriched orange juice or something. And so we have all those layers at the device, but if it's you, let's say, and you go up and you're going to have one of your three drinks a year and you just go up and tap and you hit, you know, let's say you hit a cocktail, um, it'll just ask you to punch in a four digit code. And so we also just verify right at the very end, just in case maybe your profile didn't get logged out in time and someone comes and clicks it, they still got to know your code. Okay, that's pretty cool. And so, all right, I know your new product and everything, but I'm just going to go because I, I'm a, my background's <laughs> product development. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so you are doing profiles, which the next thing that comes up is personalization. You've drank these drinks, you might also like these drinks. Have you guys gotten there yet? Or is it going to be something that you make once you have a ton of data from everybody using it? So we are, this is going to be the most personalized beverage experience in the world. Think of it as like your own barista and mixologist uh, on demand. So you can select from, you know, your, let's say it's, it's cold brew coffee. You can adjust the intensity of the, any of the ingredients that are on board the, the, the device, on board the can of one. So you can adjust the amount of caffeine that goes into that cold brew coffee. You can adjust the, so what we'll ship with is like our, can, like a can of version of cold brew coffee, which we think is, you know, it's, it's like a dark roast and it's got like chocolate notes, let's say right? And you may drink that and be like, that's awesome. I'm going to leave it. I love that. Or you're like, you know what? I really want to dial up vanilla or I want to add a little bit of mocha or I want to dial up the amount of caffeine. You can do all of that on your own and then you can save that to your profile. So the next time you come back and uh, if you do that a couple of times, we also know, okay, it looks like Joel's digging this coffee at, in the morning between these hours. So when he comes back and taps the device on and clicks his profile, the first thing we're gonna, he's going to see at the top of his, we call it our um, suggestion tray, but at the very top, you're going to see you know, cold brew coffee and you just tap and it's, it's done. Actually, there's a button you just press and hold down for a quick pour. You don't have to go through the steps once you kind of know the system. So we'll have an insanely personalized experience for people within within days. And then you can personalize and adjust on the going. So think of it as more like rec personalized recommendations based on what you've drank. Yeah. Right. But then also you can personalize the beverage yourself. Can I like make one and share it with my friends or can it go like viral? Can my, can my beverage like trend? That is, now we're talking, now we're talking, that's the future. So that's yeah. exactly what we want to do. Right. Um, so yeah, Canna is, you know, we're going to, we're going to have an interesting take on, on beverage brands. And so we're going to invite um, the beverage brands that, you know, people know and love now onto the platform, but we're also going to have some really unique bev uh, partners. And our goal is to turn, you know, YouTube creators, influencers of the world, people that already have a brand, turn them into beverage brand owners, right? It shouldn't just be for the, you know, the A-list of the A-list of the A-list people here that have their tequila brand, right? Or their whiskey brand. And so now people can come on to our platform and they can create any beverage. And we, we have a process though. We step them through internal. It's a service we provide completely for free. We create a beverage for somebody. So we've announced a few of the partners that we're, we're working with on our website, like Simone Gertz is an example. Um, uh, she is going to have her own beverage on our platform. We've well, worked what does with her. she do? So Simone Gertz, she's got a crazy awesome YouTube following. She's an engineer, like a really great engineer. And she makes um, uh, really goofy robots, like robots that are like, <laughs> like, um, well, like poor cereal or, and she goes, she, she videos the routine going through the, um, like her, her process going through and building the robot. 
And oh, nice. it's, yeah, it's just an amazing, it's got millions and millions of followers. And if you're an engineer and you know, you've probably heard of her and her videos are just spot on. Cause she explains like, okay, I tried to use like, like this type of system and I used like a, whatever, an ex, this type of six, ex, uh, six axis accelerometer to understand up and down and didn't quite work. Like she actually really skilled engineer and explains kind of what's happening and alive. And she's really awesome. Um, so check her out, but she uses, you know, she has drinks throughout the day when she's in her shop working on stuff. And so we're creating a beverage with her, um, and going to bring it to market. We, uh, want her to be the most successful beverage brand owner that she can be. And she has her own unique followings and she knows what's going to resonate with them. But eventually all the things that we're using internal to help her make her beverage, we want to turn over, like you were just asking, we want to turn over to just the everyday person and have them create a beverage say it's new year's and you want to create a really interesting beverage for new year's and share it and have it trend. Um, but we got to just put the right guardrails on there because we don't want beverages just tasting, you know, on, uh, just not tasting good on the platform. Yeah. So we got to make sure we put the right type of, uh, rails around and guidelines around people that want to create them. But eventually we'll get there, Joel, your, your dream will come true. Okay, what other thing, what questions am I not asking or what else should we be talking about here with this with this product? I think one of the other really interesting things that we're doing is that our technology, did I mention that our technology is applicable to all kinds of different types of liquids? Yeah, but we didn't go too deep into it. So like, what are some of the crazy examples that aren't like beverages? So yeah, the essentially our, we're going to become the... You know, the liquid dispensing, you know, technologists of the world will become the 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 most known and will become experts in it um, if we aren't already actually. And so, you know, it starts with beverages, uh, and then it goes to milks, and then it goes to dairy, and then that beverage line just continues down the road. There's a lot of things we can do there. And then my guess, or yeah, what how I envision it is. Probably in about 10 years, we're also doing food. So I mentioned you start to get into dairy products and there's yogurts. You start to get into cheeses. You start to get into stuff like that. That's probably the first path. And our technology is applicable there, both on the engineering side, like the molecular printer, but also on the science side where we have an automated system that can scan what's in a beverage or a food and it can print it really quickly and then we can taste test it. That's essentially how it works in three steps. And Well, that's cool. And so that whole automation system, actually the way people should think about it is it's like a computer vision pipeline, right? It's like, you know, go back a decade and people were scanning, you know, it was like faces or whatever cars and that was training the algorithm to know that's a car, that's a car, right? Or that's not a car. I guess it's just as important. Ours is essentially the same. We scan beverages and then we print them and we say, oh, that's a Pinot Noir, that's a Pinot Noir, that's a Pinot Noir through our testing um, with humans. We also have automated some of the testing. So we also have built some inter- instrumentation that mimics how humans would taste and smell beverages. And so that system can become faster. So there's some really interesting uh, well, that's uh, pretty engineering, cool. that's some yeah, cool engineering and technology yeah, yeah. that we're applying there. But, but the future path of what is possible is, I mean, this can do soap, sanitizers, detergents. Um, this can be something that you essentially get every household consumable out of, not just your beverages. So our goal is, or our vision is every liquid-based household consumable should come from a canna device. Yeah. But it would be a little awkward getting my laundry detergent from the same place. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I get my totally. You're like, punch. yeah, yeah. Hey, here's hey Matt. Uh, here's your uh, here's your soda. And then listen, I gotta just do a load of laundry. I'm just gonna get some <laughs> some soap out of here. No, you would It'll have two different, different machines. Devices. You would have your yeah. canna drinking machine. You would have your canna, you know, synthetic whatever machine. Yeah, you uh, have for, a separate for device for you know, it's pumping yeah. out shaving cream. Right. Um, you know, it's so totally separate, separate device we would have for sure, separate device, but to give you an idea of the different types of liquids that we could do. It's pretty, very, very broad. And beverages are just the first line um, that we want to go after. Again, it's about eliminating packaging and bottle waste. And detergents are just as guilty as anybody of having those single use plastic containers when you're done, not being able That's to right. do anything with them. And you're the CEO, correct? That's right. That's correct. So yeah. I have a talent question for you. Uh, sure. We have, I got, I got to do a cool interview with um, someone from Boeing 
a while back and they were talking to me about like advancements and the avionics and all this industry. And one of the cool things that they had done or that was happening was they had these giant like 3D printers that they could actually like print these airplane parts versus like building them centrally and shipping them. Right. And they were working all the licensing out and doing all, all of those types of things. My questions like with that in mind, um, is it, been hard to find talent in the sort of 3D printing world or is there enough of a foundation with the you know 3D printing that exists out there already today that there was enough talent there uh, for you guys? I'd say like kind of down the middle, like a little bit of a mix of both. And so the challenge for us is, is, is 3D printing. But I think when you boil down 3D printing, um, at least what were the way that we interpret it is it's like an electromechanical challenge, right? You got a lot of software driving a lot of mechanical parts and that's just, that, that's hard. That's some of the gnarliest like engineering problems to solve. And so we have found people, but where we've had success is people that have worked on robotics, people that have worked on some 3D printing, even um, inkjet printing. And that's mm-hmm. where we've been able to, to find success. And then we have had people from, um, from biotech as well, because we're dealing with chemicals and we're dealing with, uh, those chemicals being stored in, uh, in cartridges. We found people that have worked in that biotech space where they're used to, uh, mostly chemicals from humans, but also they're being very sensitive to what they come in contact with. So we've, we've had to pull from some really interesting places. Like our company is, really diverse, right? And then you got you got those that kind of type of DNA. Then you got your like embedded software people and your mechanical engineers and your electrical engineers because we're building this device. But then you have great designers. I love the brand. Uh, both both the physical device, which is a mm-hmm. separate typical design philosophy and whatnot. And then the digital design. I mean you guys nailed it on both fronts. So oh well thanks. Yeah we appreciate that. Yeah. So fantastic designers. And then you have an enti- entire other side of the house which is all the f- flavor scientists, the chemists, the you know, the analytical chemists, because our system again is a pipeline of beverage creation, and we're inventing, we're inventing and creating an automated beverage system, high throughput. We want it to be super high throughput, and we want it to be able, like I said, scan some beverages, print some beverages, test beverages, and do that thousands of times, <clears throat> you know, in a day or a week to be able to get to the conclusion that like this is the best tasting version of that beverage or the best tasting version of whatever consumable we're, you know, we're printing out um, and just go through that as quickly as possible. So we kind of have a really interesting, <laughs> really interesting, call it like technology group, um, broadly speaking across all of Canada. So I'm, I'm thinking about it as in like the drinks that we would make or the drinks I'm going to find, they're going to sort of like be their own unique thing. It's not going to be like, here's an imitation of this brand that you know. It would more be like, here's this new thing. Um, and then you can find really personalization, like personalized. Um, because in one of the videos, they had said something that really stood out to me where they said like, you know, the top 50 brands in the world determine what 7 billion people are going to be consuming, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's built on the profiles of, you know, the masses, right? But now you'll be able to go to personalization at like a whole new level. Um, so is that is that how you think it's going to roll out? People aren't going to look to get their name brand from your machine. They're going to look to get just an amazing thing just for them from your machine and fall in love with that. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, well, come maybe two points there that you're bringing up, right? So I think, listen, at the end of the day, people buy from trusted brands. You and I do. Everyone does, right? There's no doubt about that. That's like tried and tested it. I think, imagine that's going to be timeless. Um, uh, And so you have to establish some trust. And so for us on our platform, there's some trust that already exists with brands that are out in the world that you and I are drinking uh, right now. So we want to have those as part of our platform. However, those brands are constrained by the physical space that exists in stores now. Those brands can't, they, they probably have hundreds of different types of beverages that they could put out there. But if you're in charge of the number one selling beverage brand at one of those big beverage companies, and I come along as your R&D guy and go, listen, this Joel, this, this tested amazing. You got to put it on the shelves. 
you're going to say, no way, no way. I got a, I got a couple hundred million dollar business here. I'm not going to pull it off the shelf for this thing that like I tested in some surveys and I think it tastes okay. Right. And so that trade-off becomes very hard for you. Um, but we don't have that situation because we're all digital. We have infinite shelf space. We're not restricted. So when we start talking about, I think one of the points you brought up was around, you know, there's like 50 types of beverages that have kind of been made for everybody. That's because they have, they're limited by physical space. And when you eliminate that physical space and you can introduce hundreds of different beverages, now everybody has the exact version that they like. Right. You and I made both drink coffee, but you may like yours with a, like, I don't know, a little more of ingredient A and I like mine with a little more ingredient B, but neither of us could really get that because there's just no shelf space. Um, but now both of us can get exactly what we want. So we call that the long tail of beverages. There's lots of room for us to create hundreds and hundreds of different versions of beverages so that everybody can get exactly what they want on the personalization scale. And so that's, that's one aspect of it um, that I think you, you brought up there. And then the other aspect of it is, you know, is brands. There's going to be the ones we know and love. Like I said, there's going to be new and emerging ones. Like I was mentioning with, with uh, some of the, the interesting uh, partners that we're bringing on like Simone. And then there's going to be places where, um, you know, we may create beverages if there's a, if there's a gap, if some beverage doesn't exist for, uh, a certain type of cocktail, let's say, um, Canna might lean in and build something there. But what's really interesting is, again, that's just going to be a branded beverage to a consumer, like to someone drinking it, to me or to someone else. It doesn't really matter what the, the brand is about as long as it tells a compelling story about the beverage. And as long as the beverage tastes good, no one, there's not a lot of, you know, there's not a lot to, uh, uh, to make up for there when you're introducing a new a new brand to someone, so net new brand. As long as it tastes good, then people are going to be you know going to be it's going to meet their expectations, and they'll probably end up having it again. So it's kind of a couple different aspects to personalization there. But our theory is the long tail of beverages is the pro, is the the problem that we're solving, um, and that allows again we because we have infinite shelf space. That's going to become the thing that really drives people to come back and continue to use Cano over time because they you get a lot of the personalized beverages you want. So um, C-A-N-A dot com. People can go do their pre-registration. You're looking at maybe 12 months or so, depending on supply chains, they get theirs. Mm -hmm. And uh, is anything else you want to leave them with? We are hiring for every type of engineering job that exists. So if anyone out there thinks this is awesome and, you know, wants to come and change the world and wants to come to a company that's sustainability first, then check canna.com for lots of our op open jobs.